Good afternoon, everyone. Good morning, depending on where you are. Um, it's nice that you you are connected and that you begin with us the last lesson session. Before we begin with the um, with the discussion, I would like to give the interpreting collective enterprise the words to speak about the importance of um, language and language mediation. Um, hello, my name is Mia for Enterprise. We would like to introduce ourselves first and explain how the interpreting is going to work. Enterprise is a collective of people with interpreting experiences from Leipzig. It is our goal to support groups and initiatives that oppose political, social or cultural powers structures by supporting them with realizing interpretation at their events. We also want to raise awareness about the importance of interpreting. Language is not only a tool for communication, but inherently political. It creates reality, it reflects and reproduces power structures, it creates or overcomes barriers depending on how we use it. Likewise, we want to give language mediation a face by being pre present as an initiative with its own political objective. Interpretation is not, is not a service provided by machines. Tonight, several like-minded colleagues are supporting us. Major thanks to all of you. To everyone contributing tonight, please speak slowly and clearly. You are being interpreted. Please do so especially when reading anything pre-scripted out loud. This especially applies to reading questions from the chat. Please announce the language you're going to choose before you start contributing. This is to avoid chaos with the interpreting tech, since interpreters need to change channels depending on the language spoken on the floor. If we feel, if we feel the need to interrupt the event because issues with tech or the interpretation, we will do so via the floor, or if this is not possible, via tonight's facilitation. Thank you very much that we are able to interpret during this whole series, and I'm looking forward to, to tonight. Thank you very much, and good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, whatever time zone you're in. My name is Radwa Khaled Ibrahim. I'm an advisor of Critical Aid and Emergency Aid Medical International. And today I will guide you through this last event of our lecture series, Turbulent Psyches. Actually, I wanted to take this opportunity to remind you of the turbulent past of this specific session, which we postponed to today due to Eva's COVID illness. We are very happy that you are healthy again and with us, dear Eva. And also that you, dear Nadia, and all of you are here today to talk together about longing for the revolution enabling life. But the real turbulences, if we can even call that, lie beyond the scope of this event. The war of aggression against Ukraine was changed the old order, as some of us today have uh, never known any other, into a new order, as yet unknown. Until a week ago, an open war aggression by the European country, by one European country against another one, seemed unimaginable. On a psychosocial level, rigidity was noticeable in the face of military deployment, fear at the prospect of an attack, panic at the unpredictability of the situation. Similarly, but differently, these effects of the outbreak of war were also experienced in the outbreak of the pandemic. But unlike the long-lasting effective rigidity and slowdown in the pandemic outbreak, outbreak, hundreds of thousands of people are now rapidly organizing themselves to demonstrate for peace and for the establishment of escape routes and reception centers. This refers primarily, but not only, to Ukraine, but to safe passages for people of all nationalities and peace for people for whom ongoing states of war have become part of their everyday lives. 
In the view of all of this, we do not want to miss the opportunity today, now more than ever, to talk with you, dear Nadia Mahmoud and Eva von Redeker, about revolutions and hope, perhaps also about utopian ways of thinking. We're very happy that you have uh, recovered from COVID, Eva, and that you are both present here. Just a second. <laughs> it's being a bit too fast. I'm not sure if I'm, I see this correctly, but we're not going to begin the discussion. Oh, I'm, we are still in the introduction. Today we would like to bridge the gap between the revolution against life, the abrupt upheavals and exacerbation of inequality and exploitation that the poly, poly pandemic has triggered materially as well as socially and psychologically to the longing for another world a world of solidarity, empathic ways of relating, which after all unites you and us and many people in this world. Towards the revolution enabling life, a term you coined, dear Eva. Perhaps you noticed um, it's the choreography of, a of this series tried to look from the effects of fear, confusion, more and more also to a decidedly resistant act affectivity from sadness, anger, and care to hope and longing. But in the course of the series, it became quite clear that the hope is scarce. It is five past 12. The spread of coronavirus and the containment measures have massively exacerbated other crises and turned it into a polypandemic. The pandemic threat is, a com is complemented by an immeasurably great threat of climate change, massively driven by northern fossil capitalism, which will not only stop at European borders any more than the coronavirus did, and it is already causing massive damage in many places in the global south. Now there is a war in Europe, the world apocalypse is often mentioned. At this point of conflict, of the apocalyptic mood and the longing for an emancipatory other world, we would like to bring Rita Segato. Her thoughts accompany this lecture series even before it begins. And here too, she hits the nail on the head between what she calls apocalyptic capitalism and the struggle for hope. But we'll let her explain uh, that for herself. In terms of the, the apocalyptic capitalism, I'm going to speak about the inequality in the, in the current state. I'm going to speak about the inequality as we spoke about in the 60s and 70s. I don't believe that it's, it's enough. We are facing a, a world of owners It's like a form of a new re-feudalization of the world where there is less common spaces and of feudalisms that are much greater than over the last year, periods. There is no laws and regulations that are able to control the, the owners and their actions or who can control them or vigilate them or supervise them because the capitalism has accumulated so badly, and even the past, the, 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 the territories where the materiality of the, of the earth is created as it becomes capitalized. There has been a big um, ownership process of creating ownership of, of, of land, what basically leads to, in this moment, in this, this phase of ownership, that is also expressed in ownership of life as a thing, it's apocalyptic because the capitalism has always um, no matter of the appropriation of resources, it's been impossible to regulate capitalism because this extreme accumulation 
that is much faster and these concentrations of wealth mean that it's not possible to regulate the actions of, of the very few owners of the we world's wealth. Yeah, it's not, not possible to regulate it. It's so difficult to create legislation that limits their actions and limits the, 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 the owners. Therefore, this is basically apocalyptic. And uh, when we're speaking about the, the, in the Middle Ages, about the end of the world, I believe that this term of the apocalypse also has a form of utopia. I mean, we have, we have some hope. Therefore, always the transition towards the future. So unvermittelt und abrupt, wie dieser Sprung zwischen As abruptly as this leap between end time capitalism and hope occurs, I would now like to enter into the discussion with you, dear Eva Indio Nadia. After Coquetso Moeti already made it clear to us in his second session that there is no longer a pure online or offline, we would like now to open up this digital transnational space of joint and critical reflection with you and once more and for the very last time in this series. Nadia Mahmoud is a feminist thinker and activist from Iraq. In the early 2000s, she founded the Middle East Center for Women's Studies in London. Returning to Iraq, she co-founded Aman Women Alliance, which in 2019 became an important space for feminist debate and contestation, as well as an offering and continuing to offer services for women's safety. In 2019, Nadia was also part of the Iraqi revolution and also was its co-creator. Thank you for being with us, Nadia. Eva von Redeke is a philosopher after freelancer, freelance publicist from Germany, um, or better as she directly describes it, a critical theorist and feminist philosopher who writes about property, social change, and sometimes life and death. Her 2020 book, Revolution for Life, has been described as a possible new Bible of intellectual resistance to the imposition of actual existing capitalism. Thank you very much for joining us. In the preparation, we ask you a few questions. I'd like to begin with Eva's input. Um, Eva, we ask you the questions, what is your understanding of revolution and what affects of... Um, and I'm going to, sorry, what is the understanding of revolution and what effects of longing and hope are perhaps at play naming it a revolution for life? And the second question is which life is placed in the foreground in the revolution enabling life? Um, thank you very much for organizing and, and, and for, for, uh, for moving this. I'm very lucky and happy to be healthy again and to join you here today, even though I have the feeling that I, yeah, I don't know where to look and what to do uh, regarding the current situation we face in the world. So I'm very happy to share some thoughts um, and discuss today. Regarding the second question, uh, the revolution enabling life and revolution itself, also regarding the conditions of war and the poly pandemic, what do we see developing? Uh, I would like to answer with yes. I think this is possible if we do not confuse thriving with gaining. Also regarding the video of Rita, the thoughts or similar thoughts have accompanied me in the last couple of weeks. Even in moments when I thought, oh, where do we go from here? And I knew not where. The last phrases of the video you just played is 
we are here and this is what gives us hope. By creating these in-between spaces, we can create a surplus, surplus which can then lead us into a better future. And the idea, the th way of thinking about revolution, which I'm interested in, especially and which I have analyzed and looked at in the feminist um, movement, and I try to case this into a, or look at it from an analytical point of view, then this is a revolution which acts from these in-between spaces. And we can see a glimpse of what we wish for after the revolution, at least in shards of it, so we can see the front line of where we need to stand and struggle for those shards, those glimpses. At the same time, so from the in-between spaces, this is the, the form, the shape, but of course we need to ask ourselves what is the content of the revolution? What's it made up of? And one term which I think is emblematic of a utopian eco-revolution and change how this can look I coined this in direct contrasting to what Rita calls the world of proprietors and what I call the world of property. It is to reappropriate the world. It is something that is quite good, close to what we wish for as socialists, reappropriating. And I would like to include this definition in my text. However, this is not enough. We need to reappropriate resources that we have lost and resources that have been turned into capital and property. So from the current situation in the world, I'd like to uh, say some more words because actually we're talking about longing and effects during the pandemic, which now again have been re rused by this war. The category, I mean, everything I am going to say right now looks at exhaustion. And I believe that exhaustion is the result of what Rita Sagato calls world of proprietors. I also talk about exhaustion of background, backdrop, or perhaps source of effects. And I think there's two which we can make out. One of them is that we just fall down due to exhaustion. such as in a patriarchal cult of death, being fixated on logics of the victims, or on the other hand, a vantage point where we can see recreation in the future. And maybe this is seems a very insignificant vantage point. I believe this is where we need to start when we are working for a feminist revolution, if we work for a revolution enabling life. Well, to be honest, we were exhausted before the pandemic started, at least here in Germany, even if the health services, the health sector itself was working all right, still, all of this staff was massively overwhelmed. Institutions are understaffed. The working conditions offered by employees and institutions, which were coined by the fear from being precarized of burning out. And especially the most fervently followed paths of career are characterized by these
der sich nur ermöglicht ist. We have, we face consumption, the consumption society fueled by fossil capitalism, which depletes resources or irreversibly poisons them. If we do not criticize the world in a classical way as exploitative, but rather from a feminist point of view on exhaustion, the idea or prioritizing ownership is a good place to start because property in its modern shape is what generates abuse and destruction of things because of the way that we utilize them. Our world is segregated into subjects who can also be proprietors who are currently overwhelmed by the idea of having to fully conquer and control others and things who are massively privileged and on the other hand objects who can be appropriated or can be you can be made available this also includes human power working hours as well as human female coded capacity to reproduce and natural regeneration capacity. So all of these things are isolated and then So this isolating of objects and use of objects, coins are current situation. Of course, we are also faced with a pandemic at the moment, the, which we have tried to come up with strategies to curb it, to limit it. However, it has caused further exhaustion and everyone is longing for regeneration, this would be the positive aspect of our current situation. Now we are looking at the he hegemony of proprietors, also including nuclear weapons and tanks. And from a feminist viewpoint, the appropriation and patriarchal subordination are a very central aspect of our analysis of society. However, they should surprise us somewhat less than other aspects of Putin's imperialist attack on the neighboring country, Ukraine, because what a lot of observers try to coin as craziness, or loss of mind on the side of Putin has always been a central part of the patriarchal logic of expansion, of control, of ownership. And where this cannot be secured, the destruction of that what cannot be controlled is to be preferable. And this is the extreme point of sovereignty to prefer destruction where ownership and control is impossible. And this is what causes fear. I think there's this very odd temptation we experience from this situation we find ourselves in at the moment. And of course, from the very uh, privileged um, position of someone who consumes social media from Germany, in a way, 
It brings us relief because the invisible enemies, for example, of global warming, of financialized resources, this very diffused pain is now certainly replaced by a very clear, geographically specific, personalized alternative. And if we cannot escape pain, then in a way it is resembles catharsis to be faced with a war or to be onlooker of a war with where we can ascribe good and bad more concretely. It was a type of echo in social media where now finally reality presents it to us, but this is the patriarchal way of idealizing society. And I believe that we need to understand we are offered relief of more complex situations. In the morning, this morning, I read a very strategic thread of which accounted for how many tanks were stated where and that the Ukraine was able to defend itself better than initially thought. And I, I would wish it them, of course, but ideally they would not have to defend themselves. And in this abstraction, and this very patriarchal model of hegemony, relief is being offered from a very diffused exhaustion. We move into the affirmation of the logic of victims because at the point where we reach exhaustion, there are only two ways. The exhaustion in in sacrificing yourself or in looking for relief for yourself in re for regenerating yourself in uh, saving lives in protecting lives in the prevention of war in resisting i believe we have been endowed with a very important task and that is to keep holding fast this longing even though it keeps evading us and i would like to uh, read one quote from uh, a book by rita sagato and where she talks about the difficulty of keeping hold of this longing she says we do not know how to communicate to others how to wager on another kind of happiness that is on investing in the permanence of a world in which attachments have priority. And Rita Zagato has this very broad analysis and there are two fundamental aspects of two, in her opinion, diametrically opposed historical projects. On the one hand, something she calls conquestualism. And this is where we can place Putin, expansionist projects, where there is the colonial project, the project of things. And on the other hand, there's the relational project. She calls it the project of the pueblos of relations. And this is very difficult to communicate to others that we are honestly interested in keeping track of each other in relating to each other permanently. However, to think this is not enough. We need to actively live this. So the project of being in touch with each other, relating to each other. If we listen to feminist authors, for example, Silvia Ferrarici, who says the project of relating to each other is realized via reproductive work of collectivizing labor that originates in the household. Or Rita Segato has this very strong focus on what she calls pueblos, where she's looking at indigenous pluralist commons and links who have a 
ausgesetzt. Who have managed to stay alive and in this sense trans transgress the colonial project because they have been able to survive in the in-between spaces. I personally also like to mention these in-between spaces and of course it is easy to come up with objections to these these ideas. You know, is it isn't it this too easy? Does it actually have an effect? Etc. Etc. However, we need to counter argue these objections because they are part of the patriarchal pr project. Because the patriarchal project aims to diminish, to demean, and to stop relations, feminist relations, queer trans relations. So at least a small part of life can be removed from the patriarchal project, from the circles of ownership. So we are here, but how can this be enough? How can this suffice? Do we not want to win? And I have the inkling that this is the greatest challenge we face, that we hold on to the idea of wanting to change the entire world because otherwise we wouldn't speak of revolution but at the same point realizing that in from a historical perspective the project of relating to each other enables us to gain hope because the historical project of things the owners the conquistadores the prioritors they are not just there But they cannot claim what they are trying to do. Because if, if they are in the minority, then they will fail, then their project will fail. And when ecologically sustaining powers are in the minority, they are still able to take care of each other and to create relations that are based on solidarity. And this is a starting point and a better vantage point regarding hope from this situation in the pandemic and war with my very limited horizon, there, there is none. And so thank you very, very much for all of you, to all of you for being here tonight. Thank you a lot, Eva. Speaking of pain in, um, in exhaustion and exhaustion and pain and um, speaking about um, relief and about the spaces in between revolution and revolution for life. Um, dear Nadia, we have sent you two questions. Um, regarding your project, especially the feminist school, you have created spaces in between and equally there's um, the exploiting uh, economical interests are trying to destroy this. Um, I'm, there, I'm sure all these influences have had a lot of impact on Iraq. And I was wondering if these um, in-between spaces uh, still exist and how can we keep them alive uh, and keep the revolution going? And you've basically co-created a revolution, you thought about it um, and you are rooted in it. What is the revolution that you are experiencing? And what kind of revolution would you have had experienced? Nadia, um, you can speak. You've Yes. Good afternoon for everyone and good morning for those who have morning now. Um, I'm very pleased and honored to be invited to talk to, to all, um, all of you here uh, and be part of this, these sessions. And I'm honored to be talking side to side with Eva and to be in the same room, room with her. Um, 
yes, uh, about the revolution, uh, we call it uprising, so uprising revolution, but we use uprising here. Um, the one we had and the, the one we wish to have, um, and also I will talk about our uh, school, feminist school. school. Um, one of the most important triggers for the uprising was women protest uh, to have jobs. Women who have qualifications, higher qualifications, such as masters and PhD degrees, who were and sit in for 100 and 108 days in Baghdad and other cities. And on the day 108, the uh, riot police opened um, water on them and they fell on the floor and the uh, social media covered this and people with their cameras and videos, they um, broadcasted this everywhere. And that was on 25th of September, five days before the uprising. And we believe that was one of the um, trigger for the uprising. And it was not only in Baghdad, it was in many cities in Iraq, in Basra and other cities. Women want jobs. Women in Iraq suffer from unemployment. The percentage of women in employment in Iraq is only 12 to 13 percent only from the total number of women. And the rest are um, working like um, in the domestic work, which is not recognized, not valued. And uh, so that when women participated hugely and in different ways in the uprising, the, the slides I sent to you show some clips of the uh, ways women participated. It was unprecedented in Iraq, unseen before. Um, here, it shows women love to stay beautiful, even in the uprising. So women here, a girl, young girl, who puts makeup. And uh, if we go one by one, just I make comments here, women faced by riot police, the one after that, the second slides, we could, we could go like one after one, uh, attacked by police in Baghdad city and other cities. We have women who being killed. One of our member, her name Sarah Talib, she was killed second day of the uprising with her husband. And women try to um, protect the main squares, the main squares occupied by protesters, male and females, if we can go. They participated in uh, protecting the areas where the squares are. So the riot police do not come close to the squares. They participated in demonstrations, chanting, they uh, treated the wounded people, we can go, um, they cook food, here it's, it's in the demonstrations, and here usually uh, the female students uh, in universities and in general women or girls, young girls in particular, banned by their parents to join the uprising. So what the students do, they escape their universities and the schools and they join the protests. So you see, for example, in Tahrir Square in Baghdad from 8, 9 a.m. till 1 p.m., the squares are, are full with women, with girls, young women. Then after one o'clock, they start to go back as if they were in their universities or in their schools. Some students in secondary schools, they have confrontation 
with their um, with the, the school management because the uh, managers of the school they tried to prevent them from joining the uh, protest. These students, female students in secondary schools, they collected money between themselves to donate for the uprising. We can go um, with, with the slides. Here, this women, I don't know if you know this, that they throw stones on the uh, police. So to keep the police away from the squares. And this is very like uh, distributed widely, this, this photo is kind of women who are in like an advanced age, yet she is with young men and women who are facing the police. We can go. Um, here, these are um, very close friends of mine. I mean, the men and the young men, uh, they, they parted participated in rebuilding the squares. So we have hospitals, kind of small hospitals. We have small theaters. We have, um, of course, many tents that hospitalized uh, the wounded uh, because people, when they face the riot police, uh, they, you know, they are attacked, get uh, injured. So we have tents, so we build tents. Um, radio station, hospitals. Uh, so they were like carrying stuff here um, to, to build things around the square. This is Tahrir Square in Baghdad. We can go. Another slide. Yeah. Here we have, um, here I'm speaking here under Tahrir Square with other members. In this photo, um, in the, in the photo uh, here is Asara Palib, our member who was killed with her husband and the small child. And the other picture of uh, a young woman, her name Saba, was kidnapped. So we were asking for the release of Saba. So, so this is picket or gathering under the, the statue of um, Tahrir Square. So, I mean, different like kind of activities. Uh, women have, if, if we can go one more. Yeah, here the, you know, because the police attacked with the gas tear, the protesters. So usually we take the girls and women there and, and as well as men, they take um, Pepsi or some liquids to you know, um, remove the impact of the, the... So this is a girl who was running to take these liquids to the wounded people. This is to show how women participated and they broke the taboos you know, about segregation between men and women, which is like very common in Iraq. Here, we get together and we work together. If we can go more. Yeah, here, the, I mean, students from medicine college, uh, female farmers and male farmers, uh, I mean, from pharmacy, they come together, nurses as well, they, they came together and they try to prepare things for the wounded people. If we can go more. Also, the graffiti work, many women, participated in the graffiti work. So around the squares, you see all this graffiti work, it shows women and you know men participation and the graffiti, it gives kind of messages, it gives kind of hope and it was so motivate, motivating people. It's so beautiful, like it's, they redecorate the whole area. It, they made it so beautiful, I mean the squares. It became like a piece of art around the uh, squares, the protest squares. If we go more. Yeah, here, this the main street where people usually uh, demonstrate and on the walls, and you see above people, you know, look, uh, people passing by, um, and it shows women's strength 
um, in this uh, graffiti work. Um, so this is, I mean, different types of activities women involved in uh, to show their hope from participate to change the situation in Iraq. So they did many things that maybe they didn't even think about it. I mean, to get together, they work with people who they never met before, men and women, Tafik and Gomon. They also organized uh, books, exhibitions, and also bazaars for women who have like some products, um, they, they sold it in the, in the bazaar. This is in other city, this is in Nasiriyah uh, city. Yeah, can we go more? Here, because the protesters, female and male, they stay day and night, day and night. So some women started to put uh, washing machines and they start to, you know, they, they wash their clothes because they don't leave the squares. Like they stayed for two months or three months in the same place. So some women initiated like kind of uh, an activity to bring um, uh, wash machines and uh, they, 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 and you can, if you can see there are, they are hung these clothes around. Uh, and here in the top, it says that we can wash and iron for all protesters free of charge. So that's what one of the activities women did. Yeah, can we go more? Here is baking bread. Women participate in making food. And other one, please. So to reach some conclusion from this different types of, uh, yeah, here serving um, tea and coffee they give people and all of it, women participate, they donate money, they donate, you know, cook, they do cooking or um, serving, like giving teas or coffees and all, all of them are free of charge. So they just to keep the spirit of the protesters, male and female always up. So that's what, what they do, what they did, I mean. Yeah, can we go? Here, Sarah, with her husband. So this is, I mean, it, it became so, uh, pop, I mean, widely published this, this photo about they were there, um, and but the second day they were attacked and killed. Hmm? Yeah, okay, thank you very much. So, um, I mean, women, participated in so many different ways. This is just, you know, very, very little photos about what happened. You see families, women in their houses, they cook food and they take it to the, uh, uh, to the squares. Or sometimes they donate money and sometimes they don't have money, but they have their like rings or a necklace. So they donate gold just to keep the uprising going. They put their hope on the protest that this protest will topple the government. So they went against the will of their universities or schools. Sometimes we have many women who face the religious men when they try to, you know, push them away. And what happened on, um, I think, 8th of February 2020, Muqtada Sadr said, women and men should not be mixed in the tents, in the squares, it's uh, haram, you know, haram, <laughs> it's not acceptable, and they should be separated. And he tweeted that on 8th of February. It became such a big joke, and women decided to organize one million women protests. So in all cities of Iraq, they said one million women will protest saying no for segregation. We are together in this protest, in this uprising. So on 14 of February, 
very wide, it's not million, of course, <laughs> but it's very wide women protest. They came, most of them, I mean, the whole event was organized by young feminists. And the men made like chain, protected the demonstration, which is like lasted for maybe for two kilometers length. And they have their cars with, with drums, with loudspeakers, and it shows how, uh, you know, women challenged Muqtada Sadr, and we know Muqtada Sadr, he has his own militia, and their thugs are there, yet the demonstration was so big, it was on 14th of uh, February, which was, which was against the Valentine Day. <laughs> so what Muqtada Sadr group did, the day after, the day after they organized their protest, bringing their women who follow them, women with, with this Islamic party, to like counter uh, a protest against us. Um, and again, on 8th of, of March, 2020, again, it was big, big demonstration, despite the fact that the coronavirus started and people have to put masks and keep, keep distance from each other yet, and it was, there was a discussion whether or not we should stay home because of Corona or we should go. And people keep saying, we are going to die either way. <laughs> so we go. And then the demonstration was so big. Um, so, I mean, women put their hope and they were like really fighters and uh, they did things that maybe themselves, they wouldn't think they could do it before, but they did it. And I mean, the relation between men and women has changed so much. I mean, always they were speaking about sexual harassment, sexual harassment, but they're like, we were working together, you know? Um, so they see like they are like comrades. And so this comradeship feeling is, is, I'm not saying there is none, absolutely non-sexual harassment. I don't claim that. But I mean, this is spirit of, yes, we are working for one aim to topple this system. And I think, of course, then Corona came and people have to leave. Gradually, the squares were left and the protesters moved their work, female and male, to the social media. But then when Corona started, the violence against women, it was unseen again before. Women killed, burned by their husbands. The, the 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 rate of violence against women, like, uh, was very very high. So we have like we we see a new young feminist movement started, which is really it's a great event. I mean, for our alliance, uh, ally, I mean, uh, a man women alliance when we started. Uh, in 2020, we were in the Al Tahrir anyway, and other cities. And then the year after, we were behind our screens because it was Corona 2021. And this is first year we started, uh, you know, to have connection with young feminists. And now we are starting to have, you know, demonstration in Baghdad, in Basra, in Najaf in Kirkuk, in four cities where we have active members. So this, I think this, the, the, the emerge of young feminist uh, activists and their focus is not about the say all generation, which although I am from all generations, um, but their demand is really about women. We see some, NGOs, women who are linked with Iraqi Communist Party or with Nationalist Party, they always talk about women's rights um, as women for democracy, women for national liberation, women for democracy, women for development. Now, the language of a new liberal you know, policy, development, 
but you don't hear the discourse of against sexual harassment, against discrimination against women. Uh, for women, um, you know, they are buddies. Uh, it's, it's, so now we see a new discourse emerging from the, the, um, the new generation. They are talking about the violation and the discrimination against them as women themselves is not about women's role in society. It's, no, it's about them, the, the, the oppression they are subjected to. And this is really a promising great uh, something. Um, and I think the 8th of March this year, um, I, at least from our point of view, uh, Emma, it started now we have that this new connections between women. When I speak about women's group, women who are not member in our alliance, yet we have shared slogans, shared concern, shared demands, and of course we are so um, we are full of hope that we could so do something. In addition to, to that, we see men, young men now. They call themselves. Feminist men, and most of them are young, and they are with us. So this is something different than the traditional people who like members of communist parties who say, uh, yeah, women's rights is our issue. They are men who are maybe not connected to any political parties. I'm not saying it's bad <laughs> to go to be connected, but I mean, this discourse is a pure, to, to end discrimination against women. They see this in young men who saw women with them in the uprising. There is no reason for discrimination against women. And now they are trying and they want to do something. That's why in, when we had our school last year, we have a school, uh, we are, it was wonderful. Um, we have it first school only for women. But then we saw men, young men, who are interested to know uh, feminists, uh, you know, they know about feminism and feminist things. So we decided to do um, a feminist uh, school for men. This year, we uh, just started like uh, in last two weeks, we decided to mix, not to have them separated, to have, you know, men and women. And they are so active. They are really, um, uh, really hoping to do to get together and do something. So uh, I mean, th I mean, I wrote an article about what's the shortcoming of women participation in the uprising, which is like although the women participation was great, but there was lack of women slogans, uh, women demands, and I said that, and we said that in different places, like in our seminars. Um, in our articles, we said that in, in many times. But I think the women, young women started to correct or to cover this gap. That's I, why I think they, they started um, to think and to do something for themselves as women. Now we see slogans that we haven't heard in the uh, uprising itself. So we come back to the revolution, uh, like it, it's, it's a process. So, but the thing that lacked in the uprising, it comes after, after the uprising with the same content. It is um, a revolution uprising against all the reactionary patriarchal system, economic system, uh, for equality, all these rights that women want. So, what I, I mean, there are lack of maybe organization, lack of clear slogans. Um, we wish to have that, but again, it's a process. I think it, it is a learning process and we are um, learning and we, we benefit from our previous experience for next one because we, are, we completely believe that it is going to happen again. There is no way, no other way. It has to be a revolution to change the whole uh, political economic system. Thank you very much.
thank you very much. Vielen lieben Dank, ähm, Nadia Shukran. Ähm, und ich würde tatsächlich jetzt sehr gerne in die gemeinsame Diskussion. And I would now like to start the uh, discussion. Maybe if I can, you can turn on your video. Yes, thanks very much. I believe that on the one hand, we were able to highlight the different uh, effects and their dynamics and have gained some insights. On the other hand, we also talked about subjects and I would like to delve deeper in the question of subjects, which Nadia, you opened uh, in the most wonderful way possible. And I would like to ask you, uh, due to the backdrop of, of the common situation, who, who would start the revolution together? So of course it's a poly pandemic, so we cannot encounter each other physically very easily, but the in-between spaces and wild getting together, how can we create these transnational encounters to then forge a common revolution? So, of course, the answer must be yes, right? Is transnational solidarity possible? I mean, we just, we, I think at the moment we see some of it already. So where the feminist movement is strongest, so, I have learned a lot from Latin America and where also like the different repercussions between Argentina and Chile and then the also of black feminists in Brazil is very fruitful. And now, I mean, just hearing from Bagdad and it is just completely amazing. <laughs> so I want to just share that I, um, on transnational um, solidarity, I have a good, I have a colleague in Belgrade, Serbia, um, Adriana Zaharijevic. So a feminist theorist who has also worked a lot on, on the question of war the, and ethnic sized war there. And she was once asked on the Serbian television what it was like to be a feminist because that was seen as a really freaky and crazy thing. And people wanted to then hear what she would say about this weird lifestyle. And she said, it's great because wherever I go, I have friends already. Because you might not know it, but there are feminists everywhere. And they do share a certain language. And I, I think it's very important, and especially from a kind of white Western perspective, to be aware or to learn from the differences and kind of expect plurality. But I think it's a real fact that there is a kind of shared outlook in feminist mobilizing around work for women, liberation of reproductive work, liberation from sexualized violence that we can recognize and where we can connect struggles. So um, yeah, I, I, would, I would say if it's not possible there, I don't know where it would be possible. And I mean, what we're up against is also in transnational, right? Like machismo, capitalist um, devaluation of care work. It's all um, international and it is, and also the kind of right-wing backlash, the anti-feminism is incredibly international. And I think, yeah, we need, we, we need to learn and also just like enjoy the repercussion between the different spaces. But, and I mean, it's one of the most promising things right now like the resistance against war in Russia is led by the feminists who are the only like organizations sort of still half functioning in the civil society and also like brave and of course, like so inspiring and and I mean, awesome in their, their courage and, and also their persistence because I think persistence is maybe more, more important than courage sometimes. Yeah, but I, I'm not sure that's an answer, but that's what I would try to think through. And we definitely need to work out better how we can make that solidarity like materialize and what we can do to learn from the struggles and, and feed into them, you know, also sell whatever goal we have. I mean. Mm. 
I would like just to say that someone is having their microphone on in the background, so maybe on, uh, yeah, maybe to mute yourself. And um, yeah, Nadia, I would shortly, I think I will also change to English if that's possible. I think that's, that's maybe easier for the flaw of the evening. Do you interpret us? Would this be okay? Okay, great, thank you. Um, yes, I'd like to also pose the same question to you, Nadia. Um, as we have been already kind of talking about this question of regional and transnational um, solidarities, but also the subjects who are revolutionary, how can we think those subjects? And I would like to give to you now also the floor to um, yeah, tell us more about it and what you see it, uh, how you see it, and how you maybe also have lifted. Yeah. Um, I think we are lucky in a way that we had in the beginning of this decade, 2010, 2011, revolutions in the region, Tunisia, Egypt, and the rest of it. And by the end of the decade, 2019, 20, we have another set of revolutions. The first set of revolution, I was doing my PhD, so I was occupied with it. So I wasn't there. <laughs> But in the second wave of revolutions, uh, we were well connected with women in Lebanon, in Sudan, um, women in, um, in Tunisia, Morocco. And we try to learn from each other, what they are doing. We, look, we were looking at them, what they are doing. When we started our school, feminist school, we started Jan 2021 for six months till I think June. We had to go back to people, who we, women we met, during that, or at least we spoke with each other, to go back to them um, and we talked about um, what we have learned from this experience, what we have learned from the uprising and the re revolutions, what the strategies we used, yeah? So we made some lectures or sessions and we invited women from Lebanon, from Morocco, Tunisia, uh, Sudan, Syria. And they were talking to our participants. And in our two schools last year, in this school this year, we will do the same again. We will have women activists. So what we did, for example, uh, a women who were very famous in Lebanon, Lebanon revolution, we invited her to our session, uh, to our school. It was virtual. Uh, and we talked about what's the differences? For example, we know that women feminists in Lebanon, they raised women's demands. We, don't ha we didn't have such a thing in Iraq. And other things to compare and learn from each other. So this connections and we learn from each other. We have women from Egypt or Sudan, they, they admired and praised our school. They said, this is, or from Syria, they said, really, this is a great, Uh, project. So that's why this year we accepted women from Syria and Egypt to, to join our school. We thought we can't put boundaries because in our organization, some they said, no, 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 it should be focused on Iraqi women because we are going to work with them. Then we said, no, it's open for activists in the region. We can't put boundaries for women who want to learn and want to exchange experience. Um, so the solidarity When I bring another example, apart from the school, when Taliban controlled the state in, in Afghanistan on 15 of August, straight away, we contacted other women activists in the region. And straight away, they accepted the invitation and we came together in one meeting on Zoom and we said, okay, what should we do? Then we organized, we straight, organized uh, straight away a campaign 
to support women in Afghanistan and to delegitimize the Taliban. And he said they shouldn't be recognized as a government. So we did a few things about Afghanistan. So we have this um, kind of relations. And the same, ha same thing happened with women in Morocco. For example, they invited us to talk in their meetings, in their conferences. Uh, we, when, when Sudan adopted secularism in Sudan, I think it was in September, so straight away we invited women from Sudan. We uh, organized seminars uh, for these activists to tell us what it means. Of course, we celebrated. We consider this as achievement to have a secular state in, in the region. Um, then she came and, and, and the reason is to learn from each other. It's very important that we learn, we exchange with each other. And yet I think there should be a lot of work need to be done in this regard, to learn from each other, to, to aspire each other about you know, the strategies they use, what's the success, what's the failure. This is on regional side, but I mean, on international level, I mean, oh, now this meeting, I think part of it, part of, you know, bringing women together and talk together. I think that's part of it. Um, and of course, there are sometimes there are seminars, um, um, like in, in European countries, uh, we have been to these seminars to talk about, especially in the uprising time. Um, so I think it is, it exists this kind of solidarity, but yes, it needs to be more um, and more learning, more exchanging um, the experience and you know to, to know what can we do better next time because it's going to happen. We will have revolutions coming, I'm sure. <laughs> Thank you. I hope so too. <laughs> um, I want to ask you also another question. So the learning subject um, is someone who's quite you know, patient as well, right? Um, but I think there's also another um, emotion, another affective uh, or aff affect in that sense that quite central in the revolution. And I think it's the um, affect of anger, right? And um, I would like to ask you a question in that direction before opening the floor for um, the participants. Um, I will also ask you a question about hope, but I'll make it the uh, quite the yeah the closing statement then so you already know so um my question about uh, anger is that you know um it's quite as you write Eva in your uh, book and I hope <laughs> the English translation that I made is right um like the turbulence uh, becomes when turbulence becomes palatable still some entrenched behind airbags can keep the whiplash of the others at bay um and, uh, you know, in the session with Elsa Derlin and, when, and Veronica Gago, Jule, my colleague, connected uh, the two central or the two central parts and thesis of them, namely um, with the sentence, we want to turn anger into lust, lust into revenge. That's what uh, Derlin said. And then to continue, and our revenge is to be happy, which um, Gago then, or also the movement in which she is rooted um, was, you know, uh, said quite often. So right now, many people are not only exhausted, but also quite angry. So is anger necessary for the revolution for life? And can anger lead to hope? You choose to start. I think that's uh... okay. I don't, <laughs> I don't know if it's not, but I, I, um, I just want to listen the whole time. I think that, of course, anger is indispensable because anger has this great, I mean, we all know that, right? When we are sad, it's a kind of, it connects us, but in a quiet way. And anger gives, suddenly gives you this rush of some mobilizing, like some energy. There's energy in anger and we need energy for, for revolution. And I think what's very important and that goes with um, Vero's wonderful, turning revenge into happiness is to distinguish anger from hatred. So that's 
when Audre Lorde writes about anger, then she makes that, draws that distinction and says, in hatred, you split something off and you think it should be eliminated. But in anger, you want to transform something and kind of also maybe transform yourself and, and move yourself. So, and especially women, I think women's movements are often told not to be angry um, because we're there to attend relations. And um, it, it's much like, it's much more problematic if somebody says, oh, you hate men, then like, why, why should like the working class should hate the owner of the factories, right? <laughs> why shouldn't women in some ways um, also hate men? So I think we need to definitely reclaim anger in the way that as uh, Dorlin so beautifully describes, but I, and I mean, I'm so angry at the moment, this was not true. I mean, it's so funny because the worst thing about Germany, like I then didn't say in my talk, even though it's in the middle of the notes that we had this big anti-war demonstration, but then what happened is that our bloody parliament and our even social democratic green government decided to double the defense budget, the military budget, we already have the sixth highest in the world. And so overnight, they just decided to put um, like 100, uh, make it up to $100 billion, which is 100 times as much as we spent on the healthcare system in, in the whole pandemic, right? So suddenly there is this money, but it all goes into weapons. It, none of it goes into life uh, building. And um, I think that it's like at moments like that, <laughs> anger is like you need anger to then also have the to sustain like what it takes to to re not just get frozen or paralyzed. But I think we must be very careful in the anger not to flip into an identification with the aggressor and not to think that whoever is able to exert most violence is the winner or the model, right? And so I think feminist anger, it, it, also, it needs to be a very creative kind of connected anger to be, to be effective and not to just descend to another version of, yeah, warfare and, and competition in a way. I don't know. What do you think, Nadia? I think you have on your images. It was yeah. so striking the mix of power, but also this, like, you know, yeah. throwing the stone and making the drink as the same <laughs> act of militancy. I thought that was just yeah. I think anger is the trigger for the action. If you don't feel angry, if you are so calm, <laughs> you know, the the anger you are angry of government, state, lack of services, lack of freedoms, lack of food, lack of everything is the anger, I think, is the motive, is the, the drive, uh, the, the starting point, the feeling of anger. I think that's what brought people to take action. And then I think when people get together, they can see the strength when they are you know, involved in collective action. And when they see their work together, I think they give them the hope that they can do something together. If it, in the individuals on their own and angry about, I think it's collective of angry people separate, everyone is angry. But then when they get together, they, they, they felt, that's why women um, who donate her jewelry, and we saw it many times um, because she has a hope. They could do something. So that's why she, you know, put, and maybe that's all her savings she has. She put it. And we see many like women who risk to, you know, or young women who risk to leave their universities and if their parents find out. I tell you an experience from women in Sudan. Uh, the Sud one of the Sudanese revolutionary women said, she said the young women were afraid from their parents to find out they were in the protest more than police. So <laughs> they, they feel fear from their family. It's 
so it's like they are challenging their families, not you know only the family, the whole system plus their families, maybe their brothers or their brothers. So it's kind of revolution is the revolutions in every aspect, the house, the you know the family, the um, the system. So I think uh, people when they get together and they are engaged in action, that's why you know the spirit after the uprising calmed down and everyone went home, people started to question, is it was worth it to sacrifice like 800 person lost their lives? Is it, was it worth it? We lost like people, 25,000 people who were like uh, kidnapped. So they start to question, but again, I think that's like kind of cycle when it's the, the anger is built up again when they, the situation goes without nothing changed. Um, so I think the, the anger is, 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 is the trigger. And the hope is when people get together and they feel this kind of power when they are together and they are doing something. And when they see, for example, we have the prime minister resigned and then the crisis of the forming of, of you know, a new government or they are where discussion about the constitution, this kind of things. So people, they feel their power and that gives them hope to go on and on and on. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Nadia. Thank you, Eva. Um, you both have highlighted what it means to come together and also, I mean, with the historic project of relationality and as well um, with coming together in anger and then in hope. And we are now together in a less maybe revolutionary or uprising um, mood, but still we are together to think and to ask. So uh, I would like to open the floor for everyone who is um, here tonight, this evening, and to post questions. My colleague, Julia, um, will bring them in. Um, right. So, uh, nein, <laughs> ich bleibe bei Deutsch. Ja, vielen Dank euch. I'm going to speak in German. Thank you very much for your contributions. There's quite a few questions that um, arose. There's one that I would like to ask you as the first question. How do you link a political subjects transnationally um, and how can we um, link transnational feminist camps um, and more closely what kind of structures uh, are there already and can be used productively how the second question is how can we link the hope um, how, ca how can we how can we um, protect the the hope um, and these disconnections? Um, how can we protect the um, spaces of resistance? For especially if we are facing um, military intervention. I think uh, we are in a time now, you know, if for example, facing the Russian occupation of uh, Ukraine, I think to make our voice heard, to put the pressure to be connected, to show solidarity. Um, so we don't um, be indifferent about what's going on and to have action and to act and do what we can um, on international level. Uh, I think uh, to be sensitive towards what's going on and do something about it depends on what do something means. Um, I mean, the example I brought about, for example, women in Afghanistan, we try to do something. So I think connection is important. Having dialogue is important. Um, it might be, I mean, I spoke about the learning many times. Um, solidarity, 
financial support, uh, helping people. So it's different really, it's, uh, you know, to be sensitive and apt, not to be, you know, uh, passive about what's going on and uh, try to reach out for those who are in and, you know, work with each other. I mean, the example of medical with a man, I think that's kind of action that uh, we are, I mean, we are not big organization, we are small, we just started, but we have big projects. So, I mean, this kind of connection is very important and it has a very far impact. Uh, like really, um, um, it takes, I mean, it has, it stays for very long and the impact that with this kind of relationship, with this kind of alliance, the impact goes very, very far. <coughs> so I, I think that's what we, what we have done and that's what we need to do. I maybe just, should I follow with a few things? Um, so, uh, can, can you hear me? Because my I can, okay, sorry. Um, I, I, I want to say two things. So the, how can we protect those spaces of, of tenderness and of <laughs> I think it is very important to see that they're not only threatened by sort of losing to a bigger power or to, I mean, yeah, with this German military budget, it's very concrete, right? I mean, they're where I live in the countryside. We have some neo-Nazi organizations around. I think they will have much more weapons after this kind of program is um, in place in two years. Great. So that's dangerous. And then you have some strategies of how you can half make yourself invisible and half strengthen your connections to other people who, who you trust. But but and still it's like a 1 million times milder than people who face an actual occupation or war. But um, we can, there's not only an external enemy, but there's also the, the potential of failure, what Bini Adamczak says, like that, like any revolutionary aspiration can also fail by its own standards by not trusting the care and the tenderness and the solidarity. So it needs to be a kind of self perpetuating circle where you make enough space and time if you have it and otherwise see how you can link up with people who, who still have some bit of time and get into some kind of positive feedback loop and solidarity with them to then just keep trusting that solidarity and I mean it's there society would have like collapsed if there wasn't some care work and our whole ecosystem is built on on this kind of abundance of gratuitous things that you, I think one can connect to those, those moments of, of strength precisely from like not fearing weakness anymore. That's kind of the best that you can get to. But at the same time, I'm actually at a point at the moment where I think in the left in general and also in the feminist movement, we need to think about real like, infrastructures of mutual aid that are very concrete and material and that like also because it's so clear that right now we have no way of winning against capitalism i think we we need to try to use some of the platforms that are already there and be it just a bloody telegram chat group to also redistribute things amongst members of the movement also be, i mean the German climate movement, for instance, they're so, their numbers are declining and so many people are so burned out. I think we need a way of funding and sustaining and backing up some people who are active. And I would actually want to ask back to Nadia because you also have so much experience and background in communist organizing, whether you think there is any future for the party structure or whether something more council-based 
is maybe more promising. And what, I mean, shouldn't we have some, like, I think we would need some feminist international that where you would really, yeah, not just come together and discuss, but where, where somehow this, yeah, this channel of, okay, that movement there needs this now. And if we have it, we give it, where that can be organized very quickly. And I mean, I know of some movements doing such work. Medical, of course, is, like, one could just say that infrastructure is medical. That's it. That I think all that, like, we have to think about actual material mutual aid to, um, in this world. Have you mentioned, if I didn't mishear you, Eva, you spoke about the councils? Yeah, you mentioned it, about, okay. because in an interview, yeah. you, you also speak about the, the role of the councils. And then also, I was yeah. wondering whether you think being organized would require a party structure, because you are also like active in that way, or, or what the right form is from your point of view. Yeah, I think the councils is, the right way for political expression when we have it's not democracy that we know is the councils when it start bottom up from the suburbs place of work universities so this is where we can have people shaping and getting to shape their life participate and you know it's this structure that people start to plan what kind of political system they want what kind of political or economic system they want and it's made by them so i mean when we have the elections in iraq and i think two or three months ago we spoke about this is not political, it doesn't, I mean, this democracy doesn't allow us to have um, the opportunity for political expression. We cannot. I mean, you need to, to participate from the ground at the grassroots level and have people represented, represented not in four years elections in parliament, no, we have to have councils with its criteria and you know procedures. So this is what we believe as a party, myself, of course. And uh, of course, it's men and women, and we can uh, you know um, make our voice heard from the ground. And the idea of the council is, especially now, I mean, in particular in Iraq, we had opportunities where there was political vacuum and we could seize power because the army escaped. In September 2018, they left the government, the mayor, the militias. They, the militias, all headquarters were burned by protesters. Two days, the city was there was political vacuum. If we have the councils, we could seize the power. <laughs> That's the thing. But I mean, it is such new, um, I mean, for the political culture in Iraq, at least in the central and south part of Iraq. In Kurdistan, we have this experience in 1991, which is unfortunately is not covered enough. It's not, I don't think there are many literature wrote about it, or even maybe none wrote, up, I mean, about that, that's this experience. We had councils in Kurdistan, Iraq, it was powerful. And in fact, they controlled the cities. But we had a problem at that time. We didn't think about seizing power. We were thinking about only taking care of the city. But when the bourgeois parties came after the Saddam Hussein forces left, the first thing they did, they controlled the banks. We as leftists and communists, we don't think about controlling the banks. We are so good people. <laughs> we don't think about money. <laughs> 
sorry. <laughs> So yes, I, I think the council is the only way. And when the, the revolution happened, they should seize power whenever there is a vacuum. They should, and I'm, I mean, this is our party strategy. Yeah. I have to thank say, you. thank you, Anadia. I have to say that um, that's exactly also the experience we made in Egypt, right? I mean, we also said if we had the councils, if we have learned from Sudan, just would have been different. But um, yeah, I would like to um, just take one more question from the audience and then we wrap up and conclude. Um, okay, I do it in English. Um, <laughs> okay, just one question to you, Nadia, um, because right now you spoke about the councils as a kind of how to take decisions, how to rule, maybe as an institution, and then there is a question popping out about identity and or who is the subject of the struggle, I think, or I would name it as that. Um, someone asked whether the category women, uh, because you spoke mainly about women, uh, whether, whether they're, yeah, maybe it's about queer feminism. So what's the position of queer feminism within the uprising or the revolution? Um, and I, I took that question um, because um, in, in Germany, there has also been like in the 8th March in Frankfurt, there has also been like huge debates on queer feminism, whether it's talking about women. So yeah, you know, like, whether you consider these differences. You mean between them. women and queer women? Yeah, or queer people in general, yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, one of the nice things happened in the uprising, maybe the queer men and women, um, it's ma mainly here they talk about men. They don't pay enough attention to women, queer women. And there is a big issue ar around this. Maybe we don't have time to talk about it. Um, so the good thing is that they made their voice heard, which is really, really great. And we have their, you know, rainbow um, in, in the in the Tahrir uh, Square. Yes, they didn't show their faces because all of us we were wearing masks. Yeah. But I mean, they made their points. And uh, we talked once, one of our comrades in a TV interview, he spoke about their rights and they should be uh, like, not respected, but I mean, they, they, they are like everyone. It's not the, why, you are, why you are violating their rights. So, and this interview took a lot of debate and we have been criticized a lot. Like, this is not the time to speak about queer people. We have different issues, just leave it aside and, okay. Uh, myself, I wrote two articles about queer and, you know, um, uh, so, um, yes, in the uprising. Uh, and I think people attitude changed uh, towards queer people. Now they are, I mean, not everyone, but I mean, there are, say the protesters or revolutionaries people, they started to accept the queer people and they don't I, discuss it. Thank you, you know, they, I think I think that answered the question perfectly. And I would like to give you back the floor for the last statement because we're already kind of touching the last minutes of that <laughs> precious session. <laughs> Thank you, Julia, for bringing, for bringing in the questions. Um, actually, I have the feeling, if we're already talking about affects and feelings and emotions as well in the political context, um, that as we have, as we um, are coming now to the end of the session, it's getting more and more um, furious and it's getting more and more uh, full of um, power, actually. We began with the question of exhaustion. We began with the pain in exhaustion and the exhaustion of pain, and we came to hope and um, the longing for a different future in relations 
in the different Zwischenräume or in between spaces, if one can translate it like that, Eva, I hope it's right. Um, and also um, the question of how to materialize it um, and how to materialize also hope and change and revolution to a certain extent. And on that note, I think we have many more questions. <laughs> Um, so it's really great that we have um, a getting together afterwards or after the session. But before um, before that, I would really like to thank um, a lot of people and say a bit few more words uh, to conclude not only the session but also um, this wonderful series of events. And now I would like to switch to German because I prepared it in German and I cannot do, uh, I'm not as <laughs> good in languages to do, uh, yeah, in, in, interpret or, um, uh, yeah, fastly um, translate what I've written. So now it's German, <clears throat> now it's German again. Nun, um, well, so at the end of this session, I would like to take this opportunity to thank you on behalf of the cooperating partners and organizers of this series, meaning the Institute for Social Research, the Institute for Human Geography of the University of Frankfurt and Medical International. On the one hand, we would like to warmly thank you, dear Nadia and dear Eva. We are grateful to you for the great communication leading up to the event and that we were able to come up with a new date together so well. And even if you are absent, I would like to thank all of the other speakers for their amazing contributions, which we at Medico will try to combine and aggregate into one big flower bouquet in the coming months. A huge thank you goes to the Enterprise Collective. Thank you for your great political interpretation and your work in front and behind of the scenes and around this project. As supporting pillars of this event behind the scenes, I would like to thank Ralf Zöllner from Public Noise and our medical colleagues, Andrea Schult for the technical support. Dear Almut Poppinger, Stefan Lessenich, Timo Dorsch, Susanne Heeg, wonderful that and how you developed this series of talks together with my colleagues, Usha Merck and Julia Manik. And all of our thanks is especially addressed to you, dear participants. In the midst of this constant turmoil, you and your benevolent support have also ensured that we can now bring this series to its final session with a great deal of peace of mind and perseverance. We are all the more pleased that following the discussion with Eva von Redeker and Nadia Mahmoud, we are now the opportunity to continue discussing at a smaller scale in the so-called Wonder Room, 